Welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything travel. We explore places you've always wanted to go, as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. to the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to the GSMC Travel Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Chambers. Welcome, and I hope you are all safe and healthy no matter where you are in the world. Today, we're going to be discussing the fact that Tahiti is opening for tourism. That's right. We're talking about Tahiti opening for tourism. Also, we're going to talk about traveling to Morea on in the French Polynesian. And is an overwater bungalow really worth it? And stay tuned to the end of the show and find out 10 ways to get honeymoon upgrades. Let's dive right in. Okay, starting July 15th. That's right, July 15th, 2020. So July 15th, Tahiti will be open to all travelers. That's right. So anyone who had their heart set on going to the French Polynesian, you can start to begin to have hope of that still happening this year. So starting July 15th, it will be open for tourism. Now, there are going to be some stipulations or things and guidelines that you have to follow. Quarantine measures will be lifted in the French Polynesian borders and will reopen to international tourism from all countries. OK, Tahiti has over 118 islands, so it's it's a lot to explore. So typically we'll talk about one of the bigger places that people tend to go coming up in the next segment. But what do you have to do before booking? Because there are a few things you need to look at and make sure that you're checking that list off. Because who doesn't want to go to Tahiti? I mean, I could I would love to go to Tahiti, get on the beach, get my little umbrella drink. I'm more of a pina colada fruit drink type of person but get your drink get on that beach and just enjoy life a little bit more than being cooped up in quarantine of course that comes with spending that extra cash but before you even think about doing all of that let's look at some of the guidelines you have to follow when booking so the sars covid 2 virus test okay uh has to be carried out by all travelers in a health authority center, so hospital, clinic, medical center, or a COVID testing center within 72 hours before the flight to Tahiti. So you have to be tested 72 hours before your flight to Tahiti. So you could have be have everything great and grand all the way up to a few days before your your trip and then get tested and find out bad news. So make sure that you realize that 72 hours before your flight, you have to be tested. Okay, and that's at the passenger's expense. The results of the test must be negative and will need to be presented to the airline staff. So you're going to have to have a copy of your results, and you're going to have to present those to the airline staff upon checking or boarding your flight. The other thing you have to do after obtaining the negative test, each adult must fill out a digital sanitary entry form. These can be found online. They're going to post a link on the Tahiti Tourism website, basically you're filling out a customs link, but having to do with health screening. And while you're there, you have to allow the authorities to perform a detection test for COVID-19 if they feel necessary. And that is going to be due to those symptoms and things like that. So they have specific instructions as far as local authorities of what they are going to be mandating. You also have to have travel insurance covering your COVID-19 expenses 
or personally assume all expenses related to the cost and care of COVID-19, hospitalizations, confinement, uh, things of that nature. And this is all if a visitor should fall ill during your stay in Tahiti. Okay, you have to provide information about the stay in the French Polynesia, except for residents. Residents don't have to do that. But you have to provide information such as your itinerary, inner island transport, accommodations, email contacts, telephone, dates of stay, things of that nature. So make sure that you are looking at these before you book your trip and are willing to participate in all of these things. So it's a little bit of an extra step to be traveling right now, but I know some of you are just needing to get away, and if you want to get away to Tahiti, these are things that you're going to have to follow. During the stay, so during your stay, you're going to be wearing a mask, which is recommended, not mandated, but it's recommended from ages 11 years and older. Respect prevention measures at all times in all places. So if there's a restaurant or a part of the resort or wherever you're staying that is asking you not to do something or to follow these guidelines, they're expecting you to respect that and follow the guidelines regardless. Even though I know you're paying to be there, these are things that they're asking you to do. This also brings up the fact that we talked about in another podcast, whether an Airbnb or a hotel is going to be the way to go at this point. So those resorts might have more people. There might be more things that they ask you to do or more mandatory things that you normally wouldn't do that are asked of you, possible. Or the Airbnb, which they're few and far between, but you can find uh, places to stay or rent out that are not a resort or hotel, which gives you a little bit more privacy. But again, you run that risk of the cleanliness factor and things like that. Although when you're isolated in that part of the world, my feeling is that you're going to have a, a better sense of or a cleaner place just in general. But that doesn't mean that the resorts and things are not a good thing. And of course, if you feel you have symptoms of something or are not feeling well, there are numbers that you can call that they will make sure that you know to directly contact you with local health officials. Depending on the diagnosis made by the health authorities, you have to follow their instructions, which may include isolation measures. So you have to keep that again in mind, that you may be in the French Polynesian a little bit longer, not doing what you were there to do, which is relax. So it could be a little bit more stressful than you might have been anticipating. So keep that in mind. Tahiti is just a really short trip if you think about it, it's just over four hours nonstop flying from Honolulu. So if you can get to Hawaii, it's a really short trip. But it's about five hours from Auckland. So if you're coming from the other side of the world or Easter Island, those are both about five hours in flight. But if you fly in from the States, which most of us tend to do who live here in the U.S., you're going to want to go out of LAX. And it's about an eight-hour flight, 12 hours from New York if you're traveling from the East Coast. And if you're coming from the south in South America, it's about 13 hours from Santiago. So you can kind of get a, an idea of what your flight plan might be, depending on where in the world you're coming from. Most of us will probably fly into L.A. if you're in the States. But if you want to fly direct from New York, it's going to be a lot longer flight, about 12 hours. My wife and I, when we went, we flew from Houston to L.A. and then caught a connecting flight. And eight hours is relatively, for us, is like going from here to Germany, going to Munich or something like that. So an eight-hour flight is long, but not insanely long. From Houston to Buenos Aires, it's about eight hours if you go direct as well. So it's not that bad of a flight. And, of course, with all today with all the in-house and, or on-flight, onboard entertainment – and getting meals, and if you can or can't sleep, depending on what kind of travel you are, it'll make the time pass a little bit more. And also the fact that knowing that you're going to get off and just be in paradise. Most people fly into pa Papayete. That's right, Papayete. And they usually take Air Tahiti Nui, because that's the big airline that you want to fly out of. There, there are other airlines that you can fly out of. Uh, most are going to be flying Air Tahiti Nui. But check for deals on flights. You can find some great deals on flights. I know they used to have a deal where kids would fly free. And at first, I think it was 11 and under. I think they changed it at one point to being if you were 15. 
and under. I think they went up to 15 years old at one point that you could fly free. You just have to pay the airline taxes and some of the other taxes that come along with that. But still, hey, man, if I'm paying only 60 bucks for, you know, someone in my family to fly with me, that sure beats, you know, spending a couple hundred dollars on a flight. So so make sure that you check on online for those when you're getting your, your booking. Read those fine prints because you may, if you're taking a family, you may be able to get discounted flights for your kids. So you never know. You always read that fine, fine print and just check regularly. Papayete is the largest city that you can con- uh, can connect to do whatever mode of transportation you want getting to Tahiti. That's going to be the, the main international airport that you're going to want to fly into. And from there, there's going to be several different modes of transportation that you can catch. Whether you're catching a ferry, whether you're staying on in Papayete, or whether you have to get a puddle jumper or another flight. So you're going to have to land, go through customs, then go into the domestic area to catch or book your flight depending on what you what your travel plans were certain islands you there's no way to do it except to get a flight there are a couple islands that you can take a ferry and you can get your car on the ferry as well or you can just ride the ferry yourself to get over there if you already have pre uh plans of someone picking you up or not needing a car just doing the taxi thing but if you're going to places like Bora Bora or one of the other islands that are a little more remote, you're going to have to fly. And that way you're going to have to stay at the airport, go into the domestic terminal area and catch your flight. So make sure that you're checking all of that information. And they should, they're very helpful when you get there. We didn't fly directly to Bora Bora when we got there. We ended up taking a ferry to one of the other islands. And we went to Morea, which we'll all talk about uh, coming up in the next segment. But it was very easy. It wasn't very. It wasn't stressful at all. The airport's not huge, so once you get through customs, it's very easy to get directed on where you need to go. And once you find that out, it just the rest of everything just kind of flows naturally. Now, when deciding if you have the choice to, of mode of transportation, that can be a big thing because the price can be different. Some of the ferries are roughly around thirty dollars a person, which is when you're taking a fifteen to twenty minute ferry, maybe even a thirty minute ferry. Right across the water, it's just nice, and for 30 bucks a person, it's really easy, and that way you can save some money. Some of the flights can range from a couple hundred dollars to a couple thousand dollars, depending how far, how remote you're going. And their airline kind of has a monopoly of the area, so you want to keep that in mind. If you have to do it, there's usually regular flights if it's an island like Bora Bora, one of the more popular ones, that you can catch, and they'll have more things and more prices, but you pretty much have to go with what they're giving you because they fly that area. One of the cool things about flying around the islands, if, you, if you've never traveled where you get to fly remotely to these smaller islands, is getting to do the sail planes or the water the water planes. I don't know if that's the technical term, but you, you, get, you board them and they land and fly on the water. Some of them take off from the airports. There's some, but we had one that you actually got on. It was a, a water plane, and so you took off. It was a little bit bumpy at first, but then you got up in the air, and it was smooth sailing. And then coming down, I was really, really nervous, but you hit the water, and it was just really smooth. You felt a little bit of jerking, but it was just really nice. Now, that's once you get there. Of course, you have to get the flight over there first. And we talked about the distance and the places that people are coming from. So most from the U.S. are going to be flying out of Los Angeles, which is an eight-hour flight. And that's always the biggest question with travelers. They want to know, how much is my flight going to cost going to Tahiti? And depending on the time of year that you're going can affect your price. Also, the depending on the time... Uh, during the week or time of day that you're flying can also affect the price. There's a thousand things that can can happen to affect the price. But they can range from as little as $400. I've seen them, yes, a cheap flight ranging out of LAX from about $400 per person to up to twelve to $1,500 per person. And that can get a little bit pricey. So you want to make sure, again, you do your research Booking ahead is always preferred, and think about the time of year that you're wanting to go, and if really saving on that airline ticket is a big plus for you, you might want to consider when you are traveling there. 
High season typically runs June 1st through October 31st. That's typically high season. And lower season or low season is November 1st, typically through March 31st. There are pros and cons to traveling during each season. I personally traveled during the low season, which I found perfectly fine. The rain comes and goes. You're on an island. So when a rain shower comes in, it could be there for about five minutes. It could be there for about 30 minutes, and then it's gone, and the sun comes right back out. That's kind of island life just in general. So if it's really important for you to be there during high season or that's the only time that you can travel, then I understand. But I do recommend going during low season because you are so close to the equator that it's hot no matter what. Coming up, we're going to talk about traveling to the island of Morea in the French Polynesian. And stick around to the end of the show. You're not going to want to miss 10 ways to get honeymoon upgrades. Don't miss it. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The DSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back. We just finished talking about how Tahiti is open for business. That's right. Tahiti tourism will be open to everyone on July 15th this year, 2020. So if you have that Tahitian dream vacation that you just have to take and you can't put off any longer, come July 15th, you will be able to travel to Tahiti. Make sure you stick with us to the end of the show to find out my Top 10, or at least 10 ways you can get upgrades on a honeymoon. And who doesn't want upgrades? So make sure you stick around to the end of the show. Right now, we're talking about traveling to the island of Morea in the French Polynesian Islands. That's right. Morea is not as well known as Bora Bora. A lot of people think Tahiti, they go right to Bora Bora. We'll talk about Bora Bora on a different show. And we're going to save that for another time. But traveling to Morea is just as incredible. And it's actually a little easier to get there. Morea is only a short ferry ride away once you land in Papayete. So you land down in Papayete. You can get off your plane, go through customs, and then jump on about a 30-minute ferry ride over to the island. That's it. 30 minutes. And it's much cheaper than having to take a domestic flight to one of the other islands. So that's one of the advantages to traveling over to Morea. It's it's much closer. You're going to get some of the same beauty that you're going to get in Bora Bora and, other, and some of the other islands. Of course, every island is different and has their own unique things about it. But there are plenty of advantages to traveling to Morea. Don't think by saying, I'm going to Morea and not Bora Bora, that you're going to get this unsatisfying trip to Tahiti because... It will not disappoint you, I promise. It'll only want to make you come back and go again and again and again. There's lots of different reasons to go to Morea, and I'm going to jump right into the biggest reason, in my opinion, outside of the gorgeous beaches and the beautiful water and scenic areas, the activities. Morea is known more, it's a larger island, so there's more larger activities that you can do. And so if you're traveling with a family or a large group, this might be a good option for you. One, it's going to be a little bit more affordable than some of the other islands that are more remote to get to. And if you're one of those people that loves to do things, especially very outdoorsy things, 
then this is going to be an island that you are going to want to be at because it'll have all of the elements of the, the gorgeous beaches and waters and the relaxation element, getting that umbrella drink on the beach, as well as having a lot more of these excursions and off-roading type things and lots of different activities that you might not be able to experience on some of the other smaller islands. So let's talk about a couple of those. I'm going to talk about a few of my favorites or recommended ones. And the first and foremost, I'm going to say, you're in Tahiti, you got to spend some time in the water, man. Even if you just go to the beach and just get your feet wet, you at least got to get your feet in the water. So my first activity that I highly recommend, snorkeling and ray feeding. The rays are huge. These are not like those rays where you go to the aquarium and where you can feed that the kids can kind of put their hands in and touch them in the in the kid pool. These are massive, massive rays. I, I can't even tell you how big they are. And I believe that they are attracted to shiny objects. My wife was wearing this bathing suit and it had these little metal Thing, or shiny pieces on her bathing suit, on, I, on her top and bottom of her bathing suit. And for some reason, out of the entire group, when we were doing this this feeding, they seemed to just be coming right up to her. And I think that it had to do with the little shiny objects. I, I could be wrong. They may just like her. My wife just might attract large marine animals. You never know. But... <laughs> it's a really cool experience. One, you get to snorkel, and anywhere you snorkel in Tahiti, you're going to see beautiful marine life. The coral reefs are gorgeous. There's lots of active fish. Now, some fish can be very territorial. The little trigger fish that swim around, if they may come up to you and they may bump your mask or maybe swim at you, but don't get alarmed. They're not large enough to eat you or anything like that. Some of them just are a little more aggressive in the territory, but doesn't mean that you can't swim around and still see and witness what they're doing it's really a cool thing but on the snorkel and ray feed you it's a two-hour excursion typically it's a guided snorkel and they will give you instructions on what to expect what to do what not to do things like that and the water is never cold let me just tell you that if you're unless you get cold regardless of anywhere you go the water is going to feel wonderful you're that close to the equator so you're going to encounter a wide variety of marine life, not just the rays, but uh, like I was talking about earlier, a plethora of just different tropical fish, which is really great. And you get to interact with the stingrays in their natural habitat, which is really neat. I find that just one of those life-changing experiences to be able to get in the water in a natural habitat with an animal that large is just a really incredible experience and one that I will never forget. And you do have the chance to feed them. This is typically about $50 a person. It could vary depending what company you go with. So just check into whatever or whoever you're booking with. You might That might vary in some of the prices. Also, some might offer discounts if you have a group or a family, things like that. But it's typically about $50 to $51 a person for this excursion. And again, it's a two-hour guided snorkel and ray feeding. Another excursion, if you're an outdoors person and doer, Hiking, and you can hike the Discovery, the Pass of uh, the Three Coconuts, is what it's called, the Pass of the Three Coconuts. This is about a four-hour hike. So if you can't stand a 30-minute walk, you may want to reconsider this. There are other hikes and excursions that you can go on that are much shorter, or just getting out and walking around the beach and, and the area is just wonderful just to get out. I mean, you're in paradise, in my opinion, so... You want to get out. You want to be up when the sun comes up and in bed when the sun goes down so you can make that happen the next day. I mean, it's just kind of island life, right? So this is a four-hour trek. The trail is probably one of the most popular hikes in Morea, I would say. You begin the hike along the part of the crater uh, to the edge of the volcanic, volcanic funnel. From there, you're going to climb to the pass of the three coconuts where you may... I don't know, have the most magnificent view ever. I mean, it's it's gorgeous. And hiking up there for this to this view is not the only way to do it. There are other excursions that you can that you can get on a, a tour jeep or something else that will take you to that same spot. But if you want to just make it on your own and hike up and just feel that appreciation for the hike and the the land and surroundings, this is going to be something I really highly suggest. 
it's it's a moderately difficult hike. You know, it's four hours, so, I mean, the elevation is roughly about 850 feet. And this is something you can do any day. Some of the tours and excursions, you have to check when they are offered because they're not offered every single day. This is a hike that you can take any time you're there. Another excursion that I recommend is the Tahitian dance lesson. Going and taking a little part of the culture is always something that you should do when you travel, and this is one that I highly recommend. It's only about an hour. Some of the resorts actually offer their own Tahitian dance classes at the resort you're staying at. Others, you can find a place that offers a class, and you can have either a private lesson or do it as a group. So you can learn how to sway your hips to the sounds of the Tahitian drums. I mean, it's just just thinking about it, you know gets me in the mood to to get on the beach (laughs) not only are you going to learn the tahitian dance but your instructor will show you the different ways to wear a polynesian pareo that's how you pronounce it that's what they wear the pareo very manly for those of you that don't know what that is the best way to think of that the rock Dwayne johnson and his movies when he gets very cultural um he wears the pareo so and they teach you the basics of this traditional art. So you're going to learn movements that are rapid and rhythmic, and then you're going to learn the more slower dance. The price per person is usually based on two people traveling together. But again, check the check who you're booking with or what company you're going with. It could vary depending. Another excursion is the Morea ATV tour. If you are one that loves just to get out there, the Morea ATV tour is something you don't want to miss. It's about a a two-and-a-half-hour trek. I loved it. It's some off-roading, so it gets bumpy. But one thing I want to make sure that you always plan for when you're on an island is rain. So don't wear any type of clothing that could be possibly see-through unless you have, like, a bathing suit under there. Funny story. We were doing an ATV tour, and my wife was not expecting it to rain at that time, and... Her pants were almost kind of see-through, so I was kind of having to to hide those as we were driving. Not one of the most fun things that she thought that we did while in Tahiti, but I had a blast. But it is a fun excursion. Like I said, it's about two and a half hours. You're going to ride an ATV all over the island. You're going to see all the landscapes. I mean, it's really fantastic. You'll stop by a pineapple plantation, visit the juice factory. And again, prices will vary depending who you book with or what company you're going with. So check these out. The ATV is something you don't want to miss. Now, when we're talking about all these excursions, but where to stay, I do have a couple recommendations. Okay, The first recommendation I'm going to say is the Hilton Marea Lagoon Resort and Spa. This is where I stayed. It is a beautiful, beautiful spa and resort. You can't go wrong with this place. If you get advanced purchase, you can get a special and this is like 150 days plus advanced type of planning, uh, you can get about a 25% uh, percent discount. They do have overwater bungalows that are gorgeous, beautiful beaches, great property. I highly recommend it. Even if you're not staying in an overwater bungalow, the garden village bungalows uh, or rooms typically have their own private pool and things like that in it. Another is the Sofitel Marea La Ora Resort. Okay, you it's a... Enjoys an excluded waterfront setting, um, and it has white sandy beaches. It's located on the eastern side of Morea, so it's closest to the airport and the ferry dock. So if that's really important to you, getting from to a closer location to and from the airport, this might be a stay you look at. They, again, have specials as well. Usually you can save 25% when booking three or four nights. And sometimes even more as much as 30% when booking five, six, or seven night stays. And they used to be able to save 35% when booking a stay of eight nights or longer. So again, check the websites, check your booking agents or who you're going with for any of those savings. Make sure to always pay attention to that. It'll save you bundles in Tahiti. The third place is the Mavana Beach Resort and Spa. It's more of a boutique uh, hotel If you feel a little more excluded, which if that is what you're looking for, this might be the place for you. It's very 
characteristic of the French Polynesian. So it has a lot of that ambiance that you might be looking for. It's located in the northeast coast of Morea's Island. And it's only about 10 minutes from the airport, maybe 15 from the ferry dock. And you can get some great deals with this as well. Free breakfast, free dinner when you're booking standard rates of travel. Depending on, again, the time of season that you're, you're booking will also depend on what you're paying for that room. The last one I'm going to recommend is the Hotel Hibiscus. It's located on the northwest corner of Morea. And this is surrounded by lush co- a lush coconut grove. And it's a b- beautiful white sandy beach. It's slightly farther from the airport and the ferry dock. And a lot of the other island resorts. But it provides a pretty nice, friendly uh, budget option if that is super important to you. So you want to make sure that that's something you look into. Because some of these resort prices can fluctuate in a large range of prices. If you pay for two nights and receive a third night free, typically. uh, Most of them have daily breakfast or some kind of buffet that you can get included. Depending on what time of year you go, some will make you pay. You just have to double check. But this, the Hotel Hibiscus also doesn't have the overwater bungalow. So if that's something important to you, this wouldn't be an option for you. Now, all of these excursion and hotel talks and getting on the beach and having drinks has made me hungry. So a couple places that I will recommend, and there's not many, because some people, when they go to Tahiti, finding that it's extremely expensive, like to go to the store and stock up and bring things into their hotel room. But there are two places that I do highly recommend. The first one is a dinner at the famous Bloody Mary's. This is a world-famous seafood restaurant, and you have to experience this restaurant at least once when you go. It's often frequented by a lot of celebrities. In fact, they have this large board out front as you walk in that states who has been there. So you can kind of see, oh, this person's been there, this athlete or actor or famous person it's it's really kind of neat it's always fun to to go to a restaurant where you know other people have gone it's known for its fresh food its signature cocktails and its phenomenal ambiance the ground is actually sand so it's like eating on the beach type of but you're in this restaurant so the floor is all sand and you're sitting on these stools that are like logs and the fish that they offer is right in this large trough for you to choose for dinner. So you walk in and say, I'm hungry, I'm going to eat that, and that's what's brought to you. So it's really a neat experience. Highly recommend to do it at least once. You're going to find a wide variety of of choices from crab, shrimp, steak, chicken, and vegetarian options. Don't stray away from it if you know you're a vegetarian. They do have options for that. So now you got a little inspiration to help you plan that trip to Morea, but... Don't go away yet, because when we come back, we're going to talk about are overwater bungalows really worth it? Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to build that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back, everybody. If you're just joining us, welcome to the GSMC Travel Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Chambers, and we were just talking about traveling to Morea in Tahiti. Beautiful, beautiful island, one that everyone should go to at least once. I can't say enough 
enough wonderful things about the island and experience. So get that on your bucket list. But right now we're going to talk about is an overwater bungalow worth it? When traveling to Tahiti, everyone always says get an overwater bungalow. And I'm sure in your head or some dream or where you think about being on the beach, whether it's in Fiji or the Maldives or Tahiti or wherever it is, always imagine yourself in that overwater bungalow. Well, the short answer is, mm, I'll give you that at the end of the segment. <laughs> but let's look at some pros and cons to the overwater bungalow. And yes, there is always two sides to every coin. I want to start with the cons first. I know, let's be a bummer first, but let's get that out of the way. Then we can jump right to the pros and why we want it. So a con of an overwater bungalow is, well, the number one thing, it's the price tag that comes with it. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it, guys. The price tag is relatively hefty if you're looking to get an overwater bungalow. It's one of those costs that you have to go in knowing that's what you want to spend. It will vary depending on the resort that you stay at and where you're traveling to. Not every overwater bungalow in Tahiti is the same price as in the Maldives. And also the size or type of overwater bungalow. Some of them are deluxe or two-story overwater bungalows. If you have lots of money to spend or just money's not an object to you, or you just want to get the single for yourself and your whoever you're traveling with. So the price can be a very big thing. They can be as low as seven to $800 a night and get up to as high as 1000 to a couple thousand dollars a night. I mean, it, it's that kind of price range that we're talking about. That's a huge price range. If you're talking about spending... Six, seven hundred dollars for three, four nights. You know, you're already putting a lot of money in your trip just for your hotel stay. That's why people end up going to grocery stores and stocking up for food and snacks if you're traveling on a budget, but you want to get that overwater bungalow. If price is not an issue, then that's not something you'll have to worry about. Again, depending where and what resort you're at, you can determine if they give you a free breakfast or if you get any comps or credits at the resort with your room. And again, depending on what season you're traveling in. This is another reason why I recommend, especially in Tahiti, going during low season. There's not a large difference, in my opinion, because I traveled to Tahiti in March, and I didn't see a, a big difference as far as time of the year. Of course, I didn't go during high season, so I can't compare that. But I had just as wonderful an experience, and it was hot. I even got sunburned. Man, I, it was even the first day I got sunburned, I was there. I still remember being out there. We were waiting for our room to be ready, and we had drinks on the beach. And it was only about 30 minutes, maybe. And they told us just to wait, and we'll get your room ready. So we left our bags at the front, and we go out to the beach. And we saw this really beautiful uh, wedding ceremony on the beach. It was very private right there, but it was secluded area so it was it was wonderful we just got to kind of witness it and we we're having our drink and we're sitting there taking a picture yay we kicked off our trip and before i knew it going back in once we got into our room i think it was later that day or the next day i was sunburned it even hurt to take a shower and from then on at that point of our trip i was getting aloe and all kinds of skin lotions, whatever, just to help get through the trip. I mean, eventually it turned out okay. Thank goodness that we weren't out there any longer. I would have fried like a turkey. So just be aware of that. No matter what time you're traveling, it's going to be hot. It's going to be hot. But we did do an overwater bungalow, and so we wanted to make sure that we got the right one, and so we had to wait for them to prepare our room. Now, another con to the overwater bungalow it has it, some of them are missing a very key component in my opinion and this key component is a ladder i know you wouldn't think that on vacation that you need a ladder but a ladder is to me one of the biggest pluses with your overwater bungalow because that is your way of getting in and out of the water it's like direct access now you can jump off the dock or whatever's right there 
But some of the overwater bungalows aren't in very deep water. Some of them are in shallower water. So it just depends where you are. And so having a ladder is kind of crucial. Plus, you don't want to have to swim all the way back over to the beach just to walk through that long path down to your room. So they have to have a ladder, in my opinion. Some people don't care. Some people just like having the overwater bungalow and they just use the deck to sunbathe or relax and read and and then just enjoy being there. And I think that's great. But personally, I feel that it's got to have a ladder just to be able to access all the amenities of staying in an overwater bungalow. I mean, if you're going to pay for that price, I want to get everything that's every type of use that I could possibly want. Even if I don't use it that way, I want the option to. So having a ladder is something very crucial as part of the overwater bungalow, and not all of them give you that option. Another con is I like to be in the action a lot of times, but when you're in Tahiti or these other secluded places, you have to kind of realize that most people go for the relaxation and the quiet. But if you're one of those people that has to always be in the action and you're not just there for relaxation, yes, relax is, yes, relaxation is part of it, but you want to be able to do things. Well, this could be a con for you for these overwater bungalows because they tend to be a lot farther away from everything else on the resort properties. The other thing is when you arrive, they usually have a golf cart that will drive you down the long pier to your room because some of the rooms are very far away and walking with luggage is something you don't want to have to do. So they take you on a little golf cart and they drive you down there. You can also arrange for that golf cart to pick you up. If your room is that far, they do have room service that you can have them call and they'll come and pick you up. But let's just say spur of the moment you decide you want to go to the beach or go eat or something and or, or you make a reservation for an excursion and you have to get there. A lot of the hotels will try to be accommodating and help you out as much as they can. But if you end up having to walk, it's a really long walk. It's like taking a little mini hike along the water, which is really beautiful and great. But sometimes can feel like never ending when you're on those. So that can be a con. The other thing is that there's usually not rails on all of the overwater bungalow piers. So as you're walking, some of them are literally just docks. So you have to be aware of that. J- just know your surroundings. So that way you don't accidentally take, you know, a wrong step or something. The other thing is if you're a blo- if you're a vlogger or you're doing, you know, cameras or with your phone or you're doing Instagram stuff and things like that, be careful about walking around those. Those can be a little bit of a con because you're not, paying attention, you could step off if they don't have rails. Some of them do, but a lot of them don't. So just be aware. Another one is the glass bottom floor. Kind of a disappointment. It's really exciting. I'm not going to lie. It's really exciting thought, and it's really exciting when you get in there. But it kind of is disappointing a little bit. And depending on the weather and the tide, and again, where your bungalow is, you might not see as much marine life as you anticipated. So if you have this big notion of I'm going in, I'm going to see all this marine life. I'm going to see a shark and a whale and, you know, a thousand fish swim under my place. Well, you might. But in reality, you might not. You'll see you'll definitely see marine life. It's really neat. It's great. In fact, our side hutch, our table actually lifted up as well. So you could actually feed the fish, which I think they do that so you can attract more more life. But. The underwater or the glass, but the glass floor can be a disappointment. So if you have very high hopes and something that this feature is just going to be incredible to you, I would prepare yourself for it. I think it's a really, I think it's really great. I think it's neat and I love it. But some people put that as a high priority when they're getting their, their overwater bungalow. So just be prepared for your, to meet your expectations properly. The last one I'm going to give is if you don't swim, it could make for a very nerve-wracking stay. I've heard of some people going and it's because it's the experience they have to have, but they don't swim. First of all, if you're going to an island, I hope you have a life jacket on nonstop. (laughs) 
Or just be around a lot of really great swimmers and never leave anyone out of your sight. If you don't swim, it can make for a very nerve-wracking stay. Some people, that might not bother you, even if you're not a swimmer, if if you don't swim. But when you're going to a beautiful place and the whole point is to enjoy it and relax, this is something that you might want to consider. Now, let's move into the pros because there are plenty of pros about an overwater bungalow. The number one thing I'm going to say is it's the ultimate vacation stay, in my opinion. If you're looking to relax and you want privacy, it's the ultimate, it's the ultimate stay. Okay, It has amazing, amazing views. You have the privacy that you want. You don't even have to leave the room. I mean, you have that brings me to my next point. Another pro is it it gives you private access to the water to snorkel, to swim, or or just lounge out there and read a book by the water. It is beautiful. It is secluded, and you will feel like you're on your own vacation with no one else around. Another pro that I like about having an overwater bungalow is the unique room service that you can get. Now, they have the regular room service where they bring something to your door, but if you are in the mood to get your room service on your deck, there are some resorts that will bring you your breakfast by boat. So you can get ready or even put on your bathrobe or whatever you want, walk out to your deck, and they will bring your service by boat right up and then hop up on the ladder and serve you right on your deck. And I think that is something that you can't, You can't get that in many places. So it's a really unique uh, way to do room service for your breakfast. And when you think about it, this brings me to my next point. You don't ever have to leave your hotel room. You really don't. You could tan there. You could snorkel there. I mean, everything. If you went to the store and stocked up, you wouldn't even have to order room service. You're just a few steps from your balcony to relax. You have your shower your amenities. I mean, you really don't need to to leave the room for anything. No need to walk all the way down that pier to the resort bar. You could choose drinks from your mini fridge. I mean, it really is just a vacation where you don't have to go anywhere if you didn't want to. Now, personally, me, I want to get to that beach, and I do want to get out in some on some of those excursions, so I couldn't stay entirely in the room or in the overwater bungalow and never leave. But you will spend a lot of time. And that's also a good thing. That's another pro because you're paying all that money for this room. You're going to spend more time there than you really think. This is another big, big thing about overwater bungalows. And it kind of brings me to my last point. Overwater bungalows are rare and not widely available. When we think about them, you think of those very specific spots in the world that have them for a reason. Those are the places that have the overwater bungalows. There are fewer than 200 resorts in the world with overwater bungalows. 200 resorts in the world. I had to say that again. You know, many of them are located in distant destinations too. So it's always a trip that we have to plan to get to. It's not like they're around the corner or along every coast. The majority are located in the Maldives. That's the majority of overwater bungalows. And the second most is in the French Polynesian, which is why we think of the Maldives and Tahiti when we think of those overwater bungalows, because they have the most overwater bungalows in the world. Now, there are a few other locations in the world that they have them, like St. Lucia in the Caribbean has overwater bungalows. And there's, I believe, one or two resorts in the Riviera Maya that have overwater bungalows now. But let's be honest It's not the same. You're not having that same beach, that same water, that same marine life. I'm not saying those destinations aren't wonderful, beautiful, and worth going to. But if you're going to do this overwater bungalow, in my opinion, you got to go to Tahiti or the Maldives. Now, if you don't want to leave the States and you want that same experience, you can always go to the French Polynesian Resort in Disney World. But by the time you paid for that price, you could be in the Maldives or the French Polynesian and have the real deal, in my opinion. So to answer this question, is it worth it? Yes. A thousand times yes. I'm going to say that again. Yes, it is absolutely worth it. Find a way to budget your trip and pay for that, even if it's for a few nights, or you could maybe island hop and stay on one island. 
in a regular room and then do the overwater bungalow in another place. But it is absolutely worth it. Stay with me because you won't want to miss my 10 ways to get honeymoon upgrades. The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere where you find podcasts just type gsmc in the search bar Welcome back. We were just discussing, is an overwater bungalow worth it? And guys, my answer to that is a resounding yes. It is absolutely worth it. Even with a laundry list of cons, the number one thing is it is an experience you want to have. So I highly, highly recommend it. But thank you for sticking with me. As promised, we're going to get to 10 ways to get honeymoon upgrades. Now, a lot of people when traveling to places like Tahiti or the Maldives or Fiji or any of these remote islands and things like that are going for honeymoons. Now, there are plenty of other honeymoon destinations that people like to take. So this doesn't apply just to island honeymoons or or beach type uh, honeymoon trips. It could be to the mountains or to Europe or wherever you want to go. A lot of these recommendations can apply to many types of honeymoon trips. So just make sure that you're taking notes. Number 10. It's so simple. Just ask. While it's rare to get an airline upgrade by simply just asking, it's always worth the shot. You can't get anything if you don't ask for it. So when you book your flight or you book some kind of excursion, just ask if you can get an upgrade. Depending, again, where you're traveling to might affect whether they can accommodate your ask or not. Again, traveling to places like Tahiti or remote destinations on your honeymoon, a lot of people travel for their honeymoon to these these destinations anyway. So it becomes a little more difficult for them to give you the upgrade because then they have to give it to almost everybody. But there's another way to get around that, even with just asking later in the list. So number nine, number nine, tell everyone. That's right. Tell everyone. First of all, you're getting married or you just got married and now you're going on your honeymoon. You should already be telling everyone. I remember as soon as I got married, I was telling everyone I knew who wasn't at my wedding or who I didn't remember seeing about our honeymoon coming up and that we had just gotten married and even strangers, you know, in the airport, we just got married. When we talked to random strangers on our trip, we're like, oh, why are you guys here? Oh, well, we just got married. So telling everyone, dropping that. When you're on a trip, casually drop it to those who you encounter, okay, when you're on your honeymoon. And also remind the front desk staff when checking in. You can also let uh, the restaurant know in advance that you're on your honeymoon. You know, mention it to the waiter or waitress that it's your honeymoon, things like that. You know, it doesn't guarantee any comps of any kind or any drinks or desserts or things that can be given to you or extra stays or amenities, but it can't hurt. And for them to know that, It's something that they can keep in mind. So telling everyone is another way to do it. Number eight, reach out to the hotel concierge as soon as you book. Not as soon as you get to the destination, as soon as you book. 
once you've confirmed your reservation, you know, you can email them or call them and mention that you'll be celebrating your honeymoon. A lot of times if you're going through somebody else through a travel agent or something like that and they know that's why you're booking your trip, they will mention that to your hotel concierge or whoever they're booking through. But not always. So just in case, once you have all your information and once you have your booking, whether you've done it yourself or you had another travel agent book it for you, just call and connect with them. Let them know you're excited for to come. This is your honeymoon. You can't wait. You know, a great concierge, and I will say that's a really great concierge, will, will often do whatever it takes to make sure a special occasion is worth it, whether it's a honeymoon or not someone who is really great at their job, this is something that they will strive to. And so you might be able to get a complimentary room upgrade, you know, maybe a special drink, you know, champagne or something. And when you arrive, they may be able to help you out with like a candlelit dinner or even resort credit. So if you're staying at a resort and spa, those credits can go a long way. Because let me tell you, anytime you're going to give me some credits, well, okay, anytime you're going to give us some credits, My wife is going to use those at the spa if she's got them. Number seven, number seven, fly on a Saturday. This is the day when most business travelers and the elite airline status customers are home. I mean, it's just, it's like booking on a Tuesday. When's the least part of the time or when to fly out a lot of times when you're flying domestically in the u.s they say always to fly on a tuesday when you're going to some of these remote destinations flying on a saturday can give you uh, the availability for some upgrades because if all the business and elite airline uh, travelers are not traveling on that day it allows you know for open spots and allows to when you ask if they have any upgrades that are available well you got less competition aiming for those. So you never know. You could end up with a first class ticket, even though you purchased a coach ticket. So if you book on a Saturday to fly, when you get to the airport and check in, again, what we talked about earlier, always asking or telling them that you're on your honeymoon and just seeing if there's anything that they can do, if there's any upgrades available. Because even if they're not willing to upgrade you for free, they may be willing to upgrade you for a small price because they don't want those seats to stay empty. And if no one's going to be there, you may get a really cheap upgrade deal. It may be like an extra 100 bucks just to upgrade to first class from coach when normally it would have cost you, you know, maybe $1,000 more or a couple hundred dollars more just to book that flight originally. So flying on a specific day like a Saturday will give you that option or the possibility. Number six, number six, you can always cash in on credit cards and reward points. That's always a big one. All those credit cards and points that you've been saving up or accumulated have now finally paid off for this trip, right? One way worthy of redeeming, right? I I would totally say that. You can get two business class tickets to your honeymoon destination by using those points, or maybe even if you have enough of them, even a first class. It's really worthwhile to use the points for an expensive flight. You know, when you're going from New York to Hawaii, I mean, that, that's a long flight. You're going from LA to Tahiti, that's a long flight. Or even if you have to go even farther, you're going from New York to somewhere in Europe to go to the Maldives because a lot of times going to those really far destinations, you have to have connecting flights. So the longest leg of your flight is where you're going to want to use those reward points unless you can, unless you have enough points accumulate uh, that you've accumulated to pay for both legs of the flight. And if you do, maybe you take the longest leg of each flight going and coming back to use those points instead of using them just on one way. But using those points that you've got on your credit cards and all those reward points is another way to help you with that sweet, sweet upgrade. Number five, number five, sign up for hotel loyalty programs. That's right. I said it. Sign up for those loyalty programs. They always say, are you a member of our blah, blah, blah club? Well, absolutely. Of our honors club. You want to sign up for those, and especially even if you haven't signed up, sometimes by signing up, you get this really 
large amount of points right off the bat or these this really cool upgrade just for signing up alone. So don't knock on those loyalty programs. They can come in handy, especially for your honeymoon. If, as long as you're not having to pay anything, those programs are a great way to possibly get some upgrades. I mean, some of the biggest ones that I can think of include like Marriott Rewards, Hilton Honors, uh, the World of the Hyatt, things like that. There's so many others out there, but just double check because there's a lot of different hotels around the world and they love to promote their own loyalty programs. So many of these programs are free to sign up. Like I said, double check that to make sure you're not paying anything, but many of them are free to sign up and they have a lot of perks. And you can get free Wi-Fi and exclusive hotel packages. Again, reward points and credits and a lot more. So that spa, when you get there, might give they might give you enough points for that spa to get that relaxing massage right when you get there while your room's getting ready, right? While they upgrade your room, maybe. <laughs> so sign up for those loyalty programs. Number four, stay at a brand new hotel. I know that's a little bit of a risk, and people say, we don't know. And sometimes when you haven't had any reviews on it or haven't seen what the service is like, and you've only seen pictures, it can be a little bit of a risk. But it's common that a hotel that's looking to establish a loyal customer base, um, they're willing to give out space and upgrades. Keep in mind the possibility that nothing might be available, but just ask them politely, always polite. When you're asking for upgrades, you're wanting something, so you want to be polite. But ask them politely, and if they do have something that possibly could be, they might put you on a waiting list when it becomes available. Number three, check in after 3 p.m. After 3 p.m. You'll have a better chance of receiving an upgrade if you arrive at your honeymoon hotel in the afternoon. Usually by 3 p.m., that's when most late checkouts happen or they have a late checkout around noon and then it takes them a few hours to change out all the rooms and make sure that there's clean sheets and everything is ready for the next visit. So 3 p.m. is typically when your room is ready in the afternoon. It's often a guaranteed check-in time. So if you check in after 3, the staff will have a better picture of what rooms are available. And that will make it easier if they have any last-minute availabilities for an upgrade. So if you're looking to maybe get a room on a higher floor or a suite or any extra credits or dining things or some kind of the extra amenities that come with your stay, then if you check in after three, you might have a better chance of that. Now, I'm not saying that if you check in before three, you can't still ask and they won't have a better chance. But again, 3 p.m. is a great time for check-in also, depending on how you like to travel, I'm one of those that likes to do either the overnights, gets there, spends the half day, and it gets to the hotel later in the afternoon. So for me, that's kind of a benefit as well. Number two, buy an upgrade outright. That's right. Just buy it outright. A lot of airlines will sell them on a first-come, first-served basis at the airport. These upgrades can cost you a little bit less than the value of the original ticket and are often heavily discounted on the day of departure. So if you buy it outright, you have that chance. Start tracking the cost to upgrade your seat a few days prior to your honeymoon. Then arrive early at the airport to ensure a greater probability of the empty seats available for purchase and at check-in. Because remember, you, nowadays you have to be there two hours early, so if you don't get there... They might release some of these tickets. It's just a way of giving you a chance to get that awesome, awesome upgrade to a possible first or business class ticket. You want to take advantage of that. And my number one way to get a honeymoon upgrade. My number one way. Are you guys ready? It's pretty, pretty simple. Travel during the off season. That's right. The busiest season allows for a smaller chance to get any upgrades. If you're traveling during high season, most likely those rooms are going to be booked because it's high season. Everyone's there. And that doesn't just go for hotel rooms. That also for dinner reservations, excursions, things that you might want to do. 
anything you can think of, there's a better chance of you getting this upgrade or having less people to compete with booking the same thing as you on your vacation if you travel during the off season. I mean, it's pure math. The less people there, the more room. And when you have that room or those rooms that are empty, asking for an upgrade and getting that complimentary upgrade makes it a whole lot easier for them to give you that if they have the availability. Hotels don't like things like that to go to waste because often when they give these upgrades, it's to enhance your experience, one, to make you want to come back. And also, when you leave their establishment or the excursion or restaurant or wherever you're you're getting your upgrade, whether it's a flight or whatever, you're wanting to t- you're going to talk about the experience. You're going to tell everyone. You're going to recommend things. So it's almost like free advertising for them. So if they're not if it's not being used and they can use that to help them and to help you, it's a win-win for everything. So traveling during low season or off season is highly highly recommended. Typically, that's what I try to do. My wife and I love traveling during low season unless it's somewhere that the weather is just not conducive for the kind of trip that we want or given our jobs and occupation, we can't take that time when we normally want to. But if we can, we usually always travel during low seasons or off seasons. It's just so much better for us. We like to avoid crowds. I hope you guys have been inspired to take a trip or start planning one. It's never too late to start traveling. It can open up your eyes to new experiences and even unlock things about yourselves that you never knew. I believe everyone should travel and explore more of what this world has to offer. It can give us an appreciation and love for so many things. Happy and safe traveling. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type in GSMC to find all of our shows from the GSMC Podcast Network, from travel to health and wellness to entertainment and life and happiness to sex and relationships. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's episode of the Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast.